switch and it turns things on and off, right? Using it, I can construct more or a stepwise or a step function definition for more elaborate piecewise functions. And I can convert graphs over to piecewise functions. So now I have really this mathematical function that allows me to write um, these piecewise functions, maybe how you would say inline, right? So I have just one line of it. So I can really start thinking about using algebra and, and just functional manipulation to deal with the fact that there's, there's this inline expression. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that this is somehow connected to the delta function, but it's not obvious how. And so to consider how it's connected to the delta function, what we might want to think about is um, looking at a particular initial value problem. That particular initial value problem is right here. What we all want to understand about this particular initial value problem is that it's a um, undamped mass spring system with zero valued initial conditions. And so if I just had the zero valued initial conditions over here, right, then that would mean that this mass spring system would not move. There's no initial displacement. There's no initial velocity. There's nothing to get it off the trivial solution, the equilibrium solution of the system. So what we introduce here is this Dirac external force. So any dynamics that are going to happen in the system are a result of the, the impulse that we give it at time t0 through this delta. <clears throat> so the only reason for the system to take on non-trivial dynamics is the energy that's being provided by f of t. Okay. So when we derive the energy equation associated with equation 1, the mass spring system, the simple harmonic oscillator version of the mass spring system, we multiply through by y prime. In this case, we'll use y dot, and then we integrate it over time. And so if we perform that here, right, here will be the kinetic term. All right, so the acceleration term gets integrated out to being one half mass times velocity squared. So there's my kinetic energy term. At the upper bound, t is arbitrary. At the lower bound, we have the initial kinetic energy, right? But that's been initialized to zero, right? So there's no initial kinetic energy, right? Now we have this, if that was the first term, right? those are the terms that spawn from it, the final kinetic energy here, and then the initial kinetic energy, which we've initialized to zero. Well, then this will give me the potential energy term. And from that potential energy term, we get an initial potential energy which is, again, initialized to zero. So on the left-hand side from the ODE, we have um, the final total energy. Okay, really what we want to concentrate on then is what happens on the right-hand side. Well, on the right-hand side, we have the integral of our delta source. I'll choose a different color here, so here we go. Um, integral of our initial delta source times y dot. Okay, and so if we integrate this, we have the following argument. Argument part one, if t the upper bound of the integration, if we have not yet seen the pulse, so we're going to pretend that we're the mass spring system, and so at this upper bound t right here, if t does not um, go far enough in time, namely past this t naught in time, then we will not have yet experienced this external source. And so the total energy, which we have on the left-hand side, the final total energy in the system is zero. Nothing has energized the system. There was no initial displacement. There was no initial velocity. So there is no energy in the system, and we haven't gone far enough in time yet to see the pulse. And so um, the consequence of that is that we do not yet have any energy in the system. Now, part two of the argument is, if we've gone far enough in time to see this pulse, then t is greater than or equal to t naught. So now we have seen the pulse, the Dirac pulse, and we take on energy. And so what we have here is an expression of the energy, and that is f times y dot. Notice that there's a y dot here at time t naught, so y dot at time t naught, right? And so what that means, and how I can think about that is that, let's see, let's get color. Here we go. Yes. We notice over here that because of the initialized state, there was no initial kinetic energy. And so the Dirac function, the Dirac function, I should say, is basically providing kinetic energy to the system. at time t naught. And that's what the delta is doing. You can think about the delta as like a hammer hit. And if you think about a hammer hit, right, there's this moment of contact where the force is imparted. But what that contact is going to do is it's going to push the object forward. And that push of the object forward, if I showed up an instant right after any of this had happened, I wouldn't really notice the difference between that object being in motion once I started my experiment versus that object being hit by a hammer to get into motion. So we still not have not related this back to the step function. Well, what we have here is the statement that up until some moment in time, the system will have no energy, it'll have zero energy, and then after that moment in time, it's been being given some energy from the external forcing function, and so that is the hallmark of the step function switch, right? I can re-express this green quantity right here, which is for time t less than t naught, there's no energy, and then for time t greater than t naught, there is energy, and I can express that here as f of times y dot at time t naught times the step function. And so the step function allows that switching to occur. Now, here in red, I have um, anal an analysis of the units. Uh, if you're just looking at this, it doesn't seem like it should have the right units because an energy isn't really a force times a velocity, right? That's going to give you an extra, um, what would it give you? An extra time unit. Yeah, but that time unit is resolved by the fact that we were actually integrating over time, so there's this latent time unit. If I were to non-dimensionalize time and, and do the argument that way, then you would see explicitly where that comes from. Okay. I should also mention that the way now that we should be interpreting this delta is that the effect of the delta is to provide an external force which gives a finite amount of kinetic energy. Because remember, to calculate the energy, we're going to have to perform these integrals on the differential equation. And doing that, we find out that we integrate the delta, and the integral of the delta should give us a finite value, right? That's its point. But that finite value, in this case, it represents the kinetic energy, or it's providing kinetic energy, occurs over an infinitesimal amount of time. And it is through the integral that we do to move the ODE from the second-order ODE to a first-order ODE on the velocity variable instead of the acceleration variable. It is through that integral that this spike, this Dirac spike, that occurs that provides this energy that treats it as a hammer hit, is then... Um, 
related to the step function, which is a statement saying um, nothing was happening up until the, la- the moment where the hammer struck, and then after the hammer struck, things were happening. So we're going to see the Laplace transforms interacting with unit step functions and Dirac distributions in just a second. But first, let's figure out the Laplace transforms of the Dirac function and the unit step function, and also what the unit step function looks like when it's involved with other functions. So for-